630, uh, February 22nd, 2001. Uh, this is the Madawan Avenue Regional School District of Public Board Meeting. The New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or agreed upon. In accordance with the provision of this act, the Madawan Avenue Regional School District Board of Education advertised this meeting on January 8, 2021 in the Asbury Park Press and the Storo Ledger. This notice was sent to the municipal clerks of the borough of Manhattan and the township of Aberdeen and the Madawan Aberdeen Public Library. The notice is also placed on the district's website. Can I have please roll call? Dr. Delaney. Dr. Delaney? Here. Here. Ms. Friedman? Here. Ms. Martinez? Here. Mr. Montone? Here. Ms. Osborne? Here. Ms. Whalen? She, go ahead. Ms. Ascoli? Here. Ms. Rayburn? Here. Can we please stand to put the
Google Classroom, and Google Meet quickly became the new normal. We learned about synchronous and asynchronous instruction. We took our iReady and Linkit assessments and got right to work. Before we knew it, it was October, and our second and third grade hybrid students were welcomed back to the building too. Halloween was celebrated on a virtual day, and as you can see, the costumes were amazing this year. In November, Strathmore School always honors our veterans. In the past, third grade students would create a poster to honor a veteran. Sometimes they would write about a famous veteran or a family member who served in the military. Every year, the third grade students would parade through the hallways to show off their posters to the other students in the school. Last year, Board of Education member Mr. Montone was our master of ceremonies. This year, due to the restrictions, we couldn't do a parade, but that didn't stop us. Students created Google slide presentations and we moved our ceremony outside to the flagpole. This year, we honored our very own crossing guard, Mr. Ron Palladino. And every morning and af every afternoon, you can see him safely crossing our students across Church Street. Next time you drive by Strathmore School, be sure to wave to Mr. Palladino. In December, we selected our Strathmore Teacher of the Year for the 2020-2021 school year. Congratulations to Mrs. Deborah Smith and our Educational Service Professional, Nurse Kathy Morazzi. When the students heard that I was sharing some highlights tonight, they begged me to mention that they were very happy with their snow days and wanted me to thank Dr. Micah for giving them time to step away from their computers and have some fun in the snow. February 16th was our 100th day of school. Strathmore students traveled in time to the future to dress up as their future selves. This is what they plan to look like when they are 100 years old. As part of our school-wide enrichment program, Students in every class are working very hard to create pictures, stories, and essays to document this time in their lives. We are in the process of collecting items from every student and will be closing this time capsule at the end of this year. Our younger students trace their own hands to mark this time in their lives. Our older students type letters to their future selves. Our time capsule will remain closed for 19 years. Here is a sneak peek of the virtual portion of our time capsule and the story of where we began and how we are getting through it together. Thank you to Mrs. Christie for this amazing video. Hopefully it will play.
More than 100 corporate families participated in the live event, which uh, contained magic, jokes, and an overall positive message for the kids. Also, Kirkwood was recently recognized as a kindness certified school for the second year in a row, and we are very proud to have earned this uh, award again. Uh, Kirkwood is doing their big project, One School, One Book, again this year. The whole school will read parts of a classic chapter of the book every, for every school day in March. The book title is a surprise for now, but the students will hear clues uh, from February 22nd to March 1st. And the book will be announced at their next family night on March 2nd. Uh, well, they'll have fun events for students to celebrate the importance of reading. Next, we have a Bean Drive Elementary School. Uh, so to celebrate Valentine's Day and spread the love, several of the uh, Drive's teachers, including uh, Ms. Uh, Deswitz, uh, Ms. Mini, Ms. Papa, and Ms. Pichard, uh, participated in creating virtual Valentine's that were sent to the children at St. Jude's Hospital. So that was very really sweet. And lastly, we have Cambridge Park Elementary School. Uh, this month, Cambridge Park welcomes more than 80 new students and an additional 25 to their classroom at, the, at their YMCA site. And they're very excited to uh, grow and be in school year. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much, and I do apologize for jumping or jumping over you. You were going to do the pledge tonight, um, so that you know in the future I'll, I'll wait on you to do the pledge. Um, it's okay. Yeah, okay, it's okay. But, yeah, but in the future you'll be doing the pledge. We'll just wait on you to, to connect. Okay. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great job. Of course. Thank you so much. Before we move to executive session, I just wanted to take a, a minute. Um, tonight is um, Mr. Venanzi's last board meeting with us. Um, he has been here as the interim for the last few months. Um, but more than that, Tom has come on board on three separate occasions, two times uh, as an interim BA and once as an interim um, human resources director. And uh, I, speaking on behalf of everyone up here, the, the work that Tom has done for us over the span of probably close to two years has been tremendous. Uh, we're eternally grateful for you, Tom, and we wish you nothing but the best. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
go and targeted professional development opportunities for all the teachers in K-12. We want to make sure that the, the district-wide uh, technology access and programs. And we all also want to make sure that there's increased achievement for all the students. Now, with that being said, our district is right on point. They've been working um, not only to get these goals reach this year, but we also have to remember that we are planning for the next year and the year after that, and so on. So first, there was a little talk about um, the Elementary Literacy Task Force that um, is set up with a variety of teachers, and it's put in place so that they can research and review some of the different literacy programs, because they're trying to understand the science of reading. You can't just teach reading without knowing what's behind how to learn to read. So um, the literacy leadership team um, has a vision for the Madawan Regional School District. The elementary educators prepare the students um, to be engaged readers, effective communicators, thoughtful writers, and of course, lifelong independent learners that can contribute to um, a positive community. So right now, the task force is working on um, piloting two literacy programs with the younger grades uh, that will start in March. And there will be parent and teacher workshops so that everyone knows what these programs are about. Because it's not just for the students. Parents have to remember that they do as well need to be um, involved. Also, um, moving on with that, Teachers are learning uh, or being able to use, uh, or using resources, I should say, through a pro program called Thought Partners. And there's a teacher in every grade, in every building, or K-5, who are working together to uh, plan instructional supports for all the grade level teachers so that the curriculum can be taught both for the hybrid and for the students that are staying remote. So the teachers should take advantage of these resources because now it's going to be put in one place. Resources for teachers are very important. Teachers need to continue their education, which then goes to the professional development that our district always prepares for. And the district has put out um, a survey for the teachers to find out what they're interested in learning. What is it that they need to learn to help teach our kids? Um, and those uh, that the PDs are uh, meant to be purposeful and effective and tools that are continued for online learning as well as in person. We also discussed how the district is uh, moving forward to meet state requirements for um, some new courses or electives at the high school level for grade 9 to 12. Um, these courses are going to be uh, geared towards um, equity and inclusiveness, which you'll learn more about that as those courses uh, do develop. They are, um, a district as well, is making sure that the standards that your children are learning are up to date and is what is required by the state of New Jersey. And um, over the next few years, September 2021, September 2022, when we're all still here, um, the district will be updating standards in all areas, some areas being the visual and performing arts, career readiness, world language, and science. And there's many more. That's just a few that I am mentioning. Also, um, in the works is talk with a gifted and talented committee that's being formed, that's focusing on updating the, the gifted and talented program first in the K to five grades, and then um, it'll move on to the older grades, but they want to, uh, the gifted and talented students, not only to focus on ELA and math, because that's not the strong uh, ability for some students, they want to make sure they're also bringing in the arts. So that's something that's also being introduced. Um, to continue with professional development, uh, there is a program teaching through a culturally, culturally diverse lens. 
which is offering teachers um, e-learning courses um, where they um, will then be able to be more involved with the idea of spreading equity and inclusiveness. And something that I actually just learned about as well is that there are some former uh, Maryland Region High School students that needed some internship hours, and they are actually trying to put together um, an equity alumni group so that not only the students are an alumni, they will come back to help build our district and community now and in the future with what's coming forward in the next years. As for our technology, we all are dealing with Chromebooks now, and the goal is for everyone to have a one on one, and every student does get a Chromebook, and we will have um, 900 new Chromebooks coming in the summer. They will be distributed. That's also more information that will come to you. Um, but we know that it's very important that each student does have a working device which also provides equity throughout the district. And that's all I have for now, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Well. You're very welcome, Mr. Aaron. Special services, uh, programs, and preschool committee. Hi, thank you, Mr. Aaron. We're going to do that at the house, please. Is that okay with you? That's fine, thank you. Thank you. Personnel policy and athletics committee. So that um, is me. We had a meeting uh, on the 16th of February. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that we uh, went through, <clears throat> it was myself and Mr. Liebman. Uh, we talked about the steps that the district is taking in trying to hire a more diverse uh, employee pool uh, by participating in NewJerseySchoolJobs.com and CJ Broad. Um, as things get closer, uh, Mr. Liebman will share with the board the dates where we'll be doing tables and working to try and attract a more diverse uh, hiring pool. Uh, they expect uh, the next policy dump, uh, which if for anybody who's new to the board or new order to the board, it seems once, twice a year, you get a thousand pages of new policy. So that uh, should be starting around the beginning of March. Um, I expect there will be some COVID policy that will be in there. The next meeting we're going to have is on the 16th. Um, hopefully, uh, we can have some other people make it. Uh, and the other thing that we also discussed was um, bringing in the transportation policy to be reviewed, which was supposed to happen last year, um, but due to COVID, it never got done. Um, so with that, this way, subscription busing and all of that stuff can stay in line without being disturbed for what we all hope is a normal September. Um, so that's policy. Anybody has any questions about that? Thank you, Mr. Finance, facilities, food services, and transportation. That's good. <laughs> so we have this meeting um, uh, and this was, we had a number of people. So it was myself, Dr. Delaney, Mr. Montel, Mrs. Scully, um, Mr. Bonanzi, um, Mr. Nasser, and our auditors were there. February. I know all the board members have been given their audit. The uh, audit packet uh, was either delivered home or you were given it here. I'm not an auditor, but if any board members have any questions, perhaps you can email them and then we can arrange for the auditors to come in. But the bottom line is that fiscally the district is doing well. Um, we have money where we need money. Um, we can always use more from the state. But um, we're doing okay over uh, $252,000 has been spent in response to COVID. I know a couple of times as board president I've given some listing. Some of the new purchases uh, which will be coming or will be installed um, that make the difference for this March rollout over five days are one of the things when you 
hear about other school districts, we we did this referendum, we had great air filtration. So one of the large purchases were these MERV uh, air filters, MERV is the rating system. Typically, uh, I gather we used to use seven or eight level, now we're at 13 and 15, um, which they're in the 10 to $15,000 every time you do a filter change, it's per filter. They weigh about five pounds each, um, which I didn't think was even possible. Some of the uh, things that we spoke about was in terms of the facilities, is looking into what we could do to better uh, increase the filtration, filtration systems on buses. They do make portable units, however, they're contraindicated for asthmatics. So certainly, um, unfortunately, that's not really a viable solution. But um, having windows open uh, can do a great deal to circulate the air, which has been proven. Um, part of that $250,000 has been spent on, which I don't know if uh, parents are aware of this, I, I believe the faculty is, but after things are wiped down, uh, we use this uh, acid as a disinfectant in the district. Uh, it's something that we make uh, on site after installing those, but they are actually tested to make sure that the germs are, are off of it. So we've invested in testing swabs to quantify and qualify the disinfection process to make sure that the rooms are running clean um, and that is one of those tiny, it's one of those tiny details that people don't realize that they are actually doing to make sure that everything is good. Um, so with that, the plexiglass dividers have been assembled. Uh, they're going up in the areas as they're being finished. And um, so we are on our way in terms of facilities. And that's what I got. Thank you, Jim. Bottom here, curriculum instruction. Good evening. Curriculum instruction, Part A, Travel. We have four staff members attending the Art of Social Justice Workshop, one staff member attending the WIDA ESL Introduction Workshop, one teacher attending the New Jersey Association for Health, TV, Recreation, and Dance Workshop, one staff member attending the NJSBASP Law Convention, one staff member attending the NJASA Social Emotional Learning Health Series, one staff member attending the Pyramid Model State Leadership Team, one staff member attending the Technology Conference Best Practices Within Educational Technology, five staff members attending the workshop Using Patterns of Strength and Weakness to Identify Specific Learning Disabilities and Other Learning Problems, and three staff members attending the NJAGC New Jersey Association for Gifted Children Conference, which will be held virtually. For Part B of curriculum instruction, there have been no additions to the agenda since the committee of the and that's all for curriculum instruction. I have a motion and a second to accept the curriculum instruction. A motion. Okay. Any board members have any questions? No. Special services, this is correct. Special services under item number one, we have one additional item. We're asking for board approval for the additional student student attending Honor Ridge Academy at the tuition cost listed and the effective dates. Item number two, we're at, um, we're asking for board approval for the following tuition adjustment and or extraordinary services for the 2019-20 school year, Montgomery Co County Academy, and the cost is listed with effective dates. Under item number three, it's a revision. It was originally approved on July 21st, 2020. We're asking for board approval to approve the new um, tuition cost and transportation cost for McKinney Vento eligible students to attend the Howell Township Public School District while residing at the address of the Medellin Aberdeen School District for the 2021 school year. Under item number four, we're asking for a board approval for the agreement with the following providers for the remainder of the 2021 school year on an as-needed basis. Solian is the provider with the cost listed for the evaluations listed and services along with the effective dates. That concludes special services. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to accept the agenda? All motion. Any I'll questions? Second. Good. I'll second. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Any questions by the board members? Mr. Lieberman, personnel, please. Thank you. Good evening. We're going to begin with a walking item for personnel and appointments for the following positions. We have the tax sheet and recommendations of the one school business administrator slash school secretary, one payroll manager, two replacement position teachers, and one instructional assistant. To the regular action meeting agenda, <coughs> personnel and resignations or retirements, one staff member listed for the resignation. Under section B, leave of absence for 2021, three staff members is listed on the bottom of page one, two additional staff members listed on the top of page two. Under section C, appointments number one, additional hires, in addition to walking items, two staff members listed as Spanish teacher and preschool teacher with salaries and fact that listed. No changes for items two and three. Item number four, extracurricular activities for 2021. One staff member listed in red under hourly activities for high school. No changes to item five. Item six, home instruction for 2021. Two students as listed with home instruction teachers and low hours of dates. Item number seven, staff rate changes for 2021. The changes actually begin on the following page, which is page five of seven. The following continues on page six of seven. This is for overloads and staff assignment changes. Item number eight, volunteers for 2021. Staff members listed at high school for their respective activities, effective dates. No additional changes to item D. That concludes the first one. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Can I have a motion and a second to accept the personnel agenda? I'll motion out there. I get a second? I'll second. Any discussion by the board? There's no policy on the agenda, so we'll go to finance. Mr. Bonanzi. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Chow, we've added uh, three items. Uh, item number six, uh, which is a revision to the contract with Aramark. Initially, uh, the contract amendment was to go into effect February 1st, uh, but we were unable to secure manpower at that time, uh, so it's being changed to be effective March 1st. Item number seven is the approval of an agreement uh, with Eastern Datacom uh, that will help put us in compliance with Alyssa's law uh, with the uh, work to be done on our phone system upgrades for the security tie-in to the uh, local police departments and schools. Item number eight uh, is a revision to the purchase of uh, trifold student desk barriers. Uh, this represents the uh, amount of purchases that we feel are necessary in order uh, to provide those plexiglass installations in our classrooms. That concludes my answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Manzi. Do I have a motion and a second? <laughs> I'll motion. I'll second. Any comments by the board? The board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on matters of interest to the school community. <coughs> Individuals wishing to speak must state their name and address. Comments are limited to three minutes duration, but an individual may speak a second time after all others who wish to speak on the topic have been heard. All statements should be directed to the board president. No participant may address or question the board members individually. All speakers are requested to express themselves in a civil manner with due respect for the dignity and privacy of others whose legal rights may be protected. Please note, while it is not the board's intention to stifle comment on matters of legitimate concern, the public should be aware that if their statements violate the rights of others under the law of defamation or invasion of privacy, they may face personal liability to the injured party. If speakers are uncertain of the legal ramifications of their comments, the board urges them to seek guidance beforehand from their own legal advisor. So right now we are going to take action on the agenda items. As 
travelers reminded, are there any public comments related to the agenda items? Now we'll move to action on the agenda items. On curriculum instruction, roll call, Dr. Delaney. Is that a yes? Yeah. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Montone? Yes. Ms. Osborne? Yes. Ms. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Escoli? Yes. Mr. Aver? Yes. Mr. Carries. Mr. Special Services, Old Paul, Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Montone? Yes. Ms. Osborne? Yes. Ms. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Escoli? Yes. Mr. Ayer? Yes. On the personnel, roll call, Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Montone? Yes. Ms. Osborne? Yes. Ms. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Escoli? Yes. Mr. Ayer? Yes. On to finance, roll call, Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Montone? Yes. Ms. Osborne? Yes. Ms. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Escoli? Yes. Mr. Ayer? Yes. All motions carry. Thank you very much, Mr. Benenzi. Uh, any unfinished business that the board would like to discuss? New business? Okay, we're moving to public comments related to additional matters. Uh, please be reminded uh, the limit of three minute duration. Please stay focused on a question that you might have and direct all your questions to the board president. So, do we have anybody online? No one? No one? No, no, no. no one came now. One just came in. Okay. Okay. Okay, you can speak. <coughs> Mr. K or Ms. K? Is K is K available for public comment? Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, I just joined uh, a little late. Um, I don't want to uh, be on the wrong agenda, but uh, I wanted to address uh, the board to Mr. President. Um, keep me out of here. Um, I have three children in the school. And I wanted to, uh, I guess, make a question as to reopening. And like I said, I apologize if I didn't miss anything that was addressed early in the meeting regarding reopening the schools for five days full time. Uh, is that a subject that was on the agenda today? Uh, no, it was not. Uh, we have discussed it, and we're collecting data to move forward to exactly what it is you're talking about. I'm talking about, I, I would think you know what I'm talking about as far as the schools have not been five days a week full time and uh, throughout the country and also in location of the state, we are able to open them and the data shows that at this point it would be completely safe to do so. It's the CDC's recommendation to do so. And I'm wondering why uh, on this day we are not already back in school. I'm not sure what gather what what information you need to gather the data is available to you. That's been available to you for uh, the entire uh, school year now. Right now, there are two surveys that are going out so that we can collect the data so that we can move forward. And we've had children in our district uh, since September at various programs. So regardless of what anyone else is doing, uh, Dr. Mike has sent out a letter on uh, Friday, the previous Friday. And as we're collecting this data, then we're going to be able to move forward. We're looking at mid-March to start our first phase. But the data is going to direct in terms of what we're going okay. to do and what we're not able to do. Okay, so um, with the time remaining, um, the data, the American Academy of Pediatrics reports children are 0.00% to 0.23% of all COVID deaths. 17 states report zero child deaths. 0% to 0.14% of all child COVID cases result in death. In other words, children are not dying from this. Uh, we have car crashes in the U.S. last year. 38,800, that's from the National Safety Council. We did not close the highways. We did not affect the economy with it. 
So the fact that infections are wherever they are is irrelevant to the demographic of your children that are in your schools, as well as your staff and their general demographic. I'm sure they're outliers, of course. Okay, so we have every 1,000 people infected with the coronavirus under age 50, almost none will die. CDC is your source. The rate for those in their 70s, I'm guessing you don't have a lot of teachers in their 70s, is 116 per 1,000. Again, source, CDC. All right, Mr. K, uh, we, we, are, Keep me we, we are aware of everything that you're saying, <clears throat> but at the same time, we have to look at our community, our staffing, our children, and as I just said, we are collecting the data with the hopes of moving forward as per doctor's letter last Friday by mid-March. So that's our plan, that's what we're going to do. Okay, I, I, I think you are way, way behind the ball in the data that you're saying collect like data. Your data you're collecting is opinions from specific parents on whether they're gonna send their children or not to school. And, and that's neither here nor there, in fact, you're collecting property taxes to fund your school system, and you're not hoping based on whether parents want to send them or not. That, that just doesn't make any sense when, for the last year, the, the risk to the demographic that you have in your school is almost zero risk. I just read you the source information from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. I, I I'm not sure what you're waiting for. Okay. You're gathering data of who wants to go to school? I've, I've already answered that question. We need to move on to the next call. Thank you. Nicole Johnson. Nicole Johnson. Nicole, Nicole Johnson. Christine Johnson. Oh, uh, that Nicole's there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hello all, Nicole Johnson, 12 Main Street, Aberdeen. Um, good evening, Ms. Kitten, um, Ms. Dr. Mike, then the board of that. I just had two quick questions. Um, I'm happy to hear about the five-day plan. I just wanted to uh, specifically ask if every child going to have their own plexiglass? And second, um, is there any plans? I, I attend the board meetings pretty often, even before COVID. Um, but I just wanted to know if there was any specific plan to try to return to more of a traditional teaching method besides just the Google Classroom and assignments like that? You're talking about returning to in-person, correct? No, um, I know when they're in person, they're in the classroom, but they're still really learning from the laptops and Chromebooks. So I wanted to know if the teachers are going to be able to like um, engage anymore or there's just more investment still in Google Classroom. And one on the board of the Mr. Bonker? So, yes, our goal is when we return to in person instruction, uh, although we'll be following the social distancing uh, guidelines in terms of teacher with the students, um, traditional instruction would be taking place um, as much to the greatest extent possible. So, our goal is when the students are in the classroom, when the teachers are in the classroom, to maximize that instructional time um, whenever possible. So, the Google Classroom is the platform we use. Um, for assignments and submissions online. However, when they are in the classroom, that is our goal, is to make it as meaningful as possible and maximize that time face to face. Okay, yeah. I know the teachers are trying so hard now. I see it with my son, the teachers have been at school at home. Um, all right, and what about the uh, plexiglass? Is it gonna be one for each child or is it gonna be set up a little differently or you don't know just yet? We need to wait on the results from the two surveys that are out that that will be collected by Friday of this week. Okay, I understand that's how you can decide how you can do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Santora. Ms. Santora. Hi, my name is Cindy Santora, 418 Lloyd Road. Um, I actually have a question about um, summer programs. Um, are you guys thinking about doing a summer program? I know it's been uh, really popular right now. A lot of the school districts in the nation are talking about um, enrichment programs to help the students that are struggling with hybrid learning. So I'm wondering if the district is thinking or talking about doing any kind of in-person 
uh, summer program that would help the students who are currently struggling uh, virtually? Yes, Mr. Volunteer. Yes, we are planning a summer program that will be for our uh, general education as well as special education students. Um, and we have begun that planning process. And more information will be forthcoming as, as we get closer. But uh, we will definitely have a comprehensive summer program. Okay. But you're not sure yet if it's going to be um, virtual or in person? Or are you just waiting to see how the in-person five-day goes first? Goal would be to do in person whenever possible. Um, it might be a hybrid okay. approach as well. Could be in person as well as a virtual option as well. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ms. Jimenez. Ms. Jimenez. Hi. Good evening. It's Tina Jimenez from 43 Lakeside Drive. I've spoken to the board before. Um, I know there's a lot of focus on this year and finishing out this year with in person. I appreciate that. Uh, you have made the decision to go to five days, at least minimally for half days. But my question really focuses on, in, on September. Obviously, uh, it took a long time for us to get to this five-day, half-day marker. And I wanted to know what the board is doing as far as planning in regards to full-day, in-person learning, traditional learning in September of 2021. Obviously, it's not that far away. And there takes a lot of planning, and it seems to be a very slow process to get to these points. So I wanted to ask the board, what is the decisions being made? What are the planning steps that you are taking in regards to getting these kids in full days for 2021 September? Currently, we're, we're planning for all contingencies. So as you know, everything is extremely fluid right now. Um, to speculate right now, five or six months out, um, we have to speculate on everything. So right now we are we are planning for any and all permutations that that, that could exist at, at that time. But while I understand there's planning for all aspects of it, are you in theory thinking obviously the vaccines and, and whatnot are being rolled out and from stats and data that's being pushed out through the media, they anticipate that April should be kind of these markers where these vaccinations should be in the population and this herd vaccinations and the herd should be in theory, in theory, um, people should be vaccinated and the COVID number should continue to go down. So in theory, September should really be a moment of traditional learning full day. I want to know what exactly you guys are doing to think about that moment. Because I, I feel like as parents, we come to these meetings and we're all, everyone's very heated and upset. However, six months ago, eight months ago, we weren't having these discussions with the board of ed. We weren't talking about it to you. And now we're all at this moment in juncture in the third marketing period and everybody's not happy. They want the kids in school. So now we're only a few months away from September because it really isn't that far away. And we really should start planning and thinking about how this is going to work in September. And, and how we're getting these kids back full time. Not these hypothetical situations. It should be a hard and fast, yes, we are trying to get these kids back in. And that's the kind of messaging that should be coming from the Board of Ed that we and you representing the people the taxpayers of these towns that you want to go back to traditional. That's what we need to hear. We need to hear, yes, the board is backing us up. Yes, we want to see that in September of 2021, our kids will be in school, traditional school, full time. Yes, we are planning for that. Um, you know, so the answer that you're asking for is yes, we are planning for that. Uh, we will have backup plans, but our ultimate goal would be exactly what you are saying. That's perfect. That's what I wanted to hear because at the end of the day, that's, it seems that, like I said, we've gotten caught, as parents, we've been flat, caught flat-footed and we're kind of behind the eight ball and everything. And as a borough and as a township, as Abbey Township and Malone Borough, we should really be planning for September because I know this year is kind of coming to an end in the next next two, three months. And at the end of the day, it is what it is. So September is really our time to get these kids back in full time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephanie B. Stephanie B. Oh, can, I go one second? can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, my name is Stephanie Bonner, 23 Indigo Lane. Um, I've attended all of these board meetings, and like she just said, it's a little deflating um, to not hear is that your leading message is, we're gonna get the kids back, we're gonna get the kids back. Um, and my question is, so the whole time, this whole school year since September is the vaccine, the plexiglass. Now we have the plexiglass. Why aren't we doing full day? Why are we continuing to still do half day? The kids are able to eat behind their plexiglass. They're able to stay in the classroom. And like other school districts who have been full day, the specials just come to the classroom. So I don't know why we even need to wait until September for full day. We have plexiglass now. They're behind that. Half the population is getting vaccinated. And like the first uh, participant stated, it's 0.00% that anybody's even going to get it. So why are we not leading with five full days? Hello? Yes. yes. Thank you for your comments. Did anybody hear me? Yes, I did hear you. I, I thank you for your comments, and I will take everything you just said into consideration. I'm sorry. I wasn't done. I have three minutes, right? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so that question is not going to be answered. Is that that that's going to be late answered at later can, time? At, at this particular time, as if you were on when we first started, uh, we're collecting the data that we need to collect. We certainly are trying to move towards the uh, five, at least the five half days. I cannot guarantee you that by the end of this year, we're going to be, let's say, in April or May, we're going to be five full days. But that comes in phases. So as we continue to plan from mid-March on each phase, we're hoping to expand and bring more and more children back. But I, so, can't, I, can't, so, give you, I can't give you that definite answer that you're asking for. Oh, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. I'm asking that, like we just used the word phases and plans, and like we know since being a year, we really only have had one plan so far. So is there a plan? Do you have a timeline? Okay, we start mid-March, five half days. How long are we giving that to move into the next phase? Do you already have a phase that you haven't shared with our, us yet? Those are the questions that I'm asking because we can't just sit there. We should be able to say, okay, let's do this for four weeks. No issues. We should be able to increase. You're, you're right? right. Everything you're saying is correct. And that's what our intentions are. So once we collect the data, let us collect the data in terms of how many, how many parents are sending their children back to school Let's look at everything, transportation, staff, and everything. And then I, I can turn around and tell you, this is phase one, this is what we're doing. And then, as you just said, let's say in three weeks from that, what are we doing now? And that all depends on that data. It also depends on, it all depends on the DOH, the CDC, depends on a lot of things. But I can be more definitive with you and more concrete once we collect that data, once we start to develop those plans. So the data that you were just collecting is just to see how many kids are coming, or how many parents are planning to send their kids back, correct? It's, that sound, it sounds simple, but it's not. But part of it, 50% of that, what you just said, is yes, correct. Because so what I put out the form, and that's all it asked me, is if I was sending my kid to school. Or, right. So that's what I'm just trying to understand better. No, right, because, so, because you're also going to have a number of different schools, let's say, just let's say elementary, the number of different elementary schools you have, in uh -huh. one or the other, you might have many more kids coming back to one elementary school than to the other, which would cause us then to look at how we're going to uh, fulfill the CDC guidelines, Department of Health guidelines, and make sure everyone's safe. So that's all part of that data. On one hand, it sounds very simple, and it sounds easy to collect numbers, but on the other hand, everything is going to effect and dominate right. into another section. So once I totally understand that. Okay. But what I'm trying to understand is shouldn't you be planning just for the whole district? Because like the person before me says we want to have these plans in place for September and we can't be behind the ball planning in July or August. We need to be ahead of the game. So as of right now, the C D C is just suggestions. It's not concrete. So right as of right now, you said that the finality to get our kids in was the plexiglass. We have the plexiglass now. So we should be planning for the entire population to be coming back. And if they don't all come back, they don't all come back, but we're prepared for that. 
We, we, are, we are planning for that, but as I said, we're going to go through different phases, and you'll be, you'll be made aware in the coming uh, board meetings that we have. Okay, thank you. Pauline? Hi, Pauline Benna, 54 Lower Main Street. Um, I had a similar question. It didn't go back half day. I don't understand why they couldn't go back full day, but you kind of answered that. And um, as far as the um, survey that you sent out, I mean, at what point, what if there, if some people are just taking the easy or, or whatever rule you're saying, okay, we're never going to, it's just easier to keep to get home. Then do we never go back to five full days? No, no, that, that's not the case. No. So why do we have to wait for that that data to come back? Like I, I think the elephant in the room. I know everyone's aggravated. I, I know the size, but it's like, why are we dragging our feet? Like, what are we waiting for? Why can't we just get back to school five full days like everybody else? Well, there, there isn't everybody else, but in terms of looking at the data helps us because, as I just said to the previous caller, you're looking at transportation, you're looking at the numbers of children in certain classes, which are going to be greater than others, and to go back to your original statement is that right now, because of the pandemic, parents do have options. Well, right. Right. So, but how long do those options last? What well, if, well, let's. I, I can't. Comfortable in two yeah, years. I, 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 no, 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 no. I, I, I can't turn around and say two years. But you know, once, once, basically, the state, once people say, okay, you know, you should be able to bring these children back and guarantee not only the safety of the children but the adults that are in the room, then that option's gone. So, in other words, if parents don't send their kids to school then that can be a truancy issue. If teachers don't want to come into school, well, then they're going to have to find other ways because that would be a leave, a leave of absence without pay. It yeah. could be. So the thing right. is right, right now... They find another way to get their kid into school now if, if, right. if transportation is an issue, and you're saying that they would have to find another way. Can't they find a way now? And we could start moving. Like, if it's going to be five days and that's phase one, like, I think people just want to know when is phase two, when is phase three, like, and, it, 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 why? And, why? And, I, and I just mentioned that to the previous call, once we go to phase one, then we can look in terms of maybe three weeks later, phase two, as we continue so that before the fourth marking period, probably that is what it's going to look like for the rest of the year. All right, because you have to, like, fight for us too. You know, we, as parents, you guys have to have the children's best interest and um, we got to get the kids back to school. It can't just go on like this forever. I, I agree and we're, and we're yeah. going to do our best. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We have two, two other people that have already spoken, so if there's anyone else who hasn't spoken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.
any plan at all at this point well, in some days? I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I really do. And I understand the frustration that comes out of that. So if you could just give us to, what is it, mid-March or the town meeting, whenever we have the town meeting, that, that we can turn around and over the next couple of weeks and say, okay, look, here's phase one that's been developed. And this is where we're moving. So now we have a clear vision after the first phase of now what is phase two looking like. I don't mind, none of us mind telling you what those things are. But until, as I said, I get that information back to me, it, you know, the domino effect is we would like to see all of these children coming back, but then what's that going to do to our transportation with the fact that we still have to keep them socially distanced? And then in some elementary school classrooms, you might have many more kids in this particular building than in this particular building. So, you know, you don't want to turn around and say, we better keep this building closed, and this one's going to open. It, just, it causes another domino effect. So until we get that information back, like anything, we can't go to that phase one. What, what I can tell you, honestly, is that we are not looking to take any steps back. We're looking to take the steps forward. Unlike January, okay, is that we're not looking to take the steps back and say, all right, time out, time out, we, did, you know, we didn't do this, we didn't do that. No, we're going to move forward. I'm going to move forward at the best rate possible. It's going to be based on that data and that information, and we'll communicate that to the parents. So can we confirm that March 1, kindergarten and first grade will be going five half days? You mean mid-March? I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, mid-March? Excuse me, yeah, mid-March, March 13th. Okay, so I'm going to go back to what I just said. I'd like to say that for you. I really would. Let me get the data. Once I get the data by the end of this week and then going into next week and looking at the data, then I can turn around and say to you, we can do that. That is not what the parents in this community think. That, that no, I, I, I understand. On Friday. <laughs> I, no, I, I understand what you're saying. But as I just said to you, that in one building, they might have many more children in these particular classrooms. So if we have to switch, a child from this building to that building, okay? We're not against that. But I can't tell you, I, I'm, I can say it's an option, but I can't say to you that it's something I would do. And maybe if I said to a parent, your child's gonna go from here to here, that parent might say, well, oh, wait a second now, I, I don't wanna do that. I wanna keep my, my child on full remote. And I believe by the end of this week, uh, parents have to commit one way or the other as to how they're going to go for the rest of the year. Right, so then please, can the board also commit to those dates? Because the, I'm, I'm committing, committed, I'm, committing I'm committing to the, uh, Diana, I'm committing to the dates that you just mentioned okay. to okay. say that that phase is going to move us forward. Oh, okay. There will be okay. more so children. Yeah, yes, be, it's my learning time, for Christ's sake. There will be more children coming back in. But I can't turn around and say, I will guarantee you the kindergarten's coming in. I'll guarantee you the first grade. If, I can, if that can happen, it'll happen. But, but you will have more children returning in that first phase. Okay, but we're talking very, very short amount of time. I know. All right, so, all right, so, so what is your advice? Um, I thought that my son, who's in second grade, was going to be in five half days, March 22nd. Should I cancel the learning plan I'm paying for right now? Because I was about to. You want me to answer honestly? Yes. Um, I would say probably, but I wouldn't turn around and say, because I don't want to turn around then three weeks or two weeks after the, the first round, which I believe is March 15th. Yeah. So the next one's three weeks later. If the next one's three weeks later and it goes beyond, you know, in terms of what a date is that you need, then it's going to cause a problem. Wait, what? Um, In other words, if you turn around and say March 27th, yeah, that's okay, and the first phase is March 15th, and for some reason on March 15th, I can't include your child because of the dates, all right? But I might be able to three weeks from now, but then you, that's, that's past March 22nd. 
I think I strongly recommend that that be communicated to the community. Okay. Because I don't think that people understand that. All right. Uh, thank you. No problem. Kevin, can I go for a minute? Yes. Can, I, can, can, can we talk to the, the fact that that letter was tentative? Am I correct in saying that those dates and times and stuff were tentative and were moving forward and this was the plan? But in order to have attendance in each room, we need to get this info back? Two things. You said if, if, if the numbers keep going down like they have been, this is what we're looking to do and we need to collect the data on who's coming in and who isn't to make the decisions on the classrooms, yes. Right, because in order to make a, a, an informed decision, we need to know how many kids are sitting in a room. That's correct. And, and to the summer program part, um, we will, without a doubt, be having an extremely robust summer program. And we have been allotted federal funds this week to, to ensure that that gets accomplished. So it, at, at some point, uh, it, it's going to look like pro it, it will be progress. We just don't have definitive numbers to what yet. We, we have to collect the data on the for the class for the class for the numbers of people coming in, right. so we can then go through that process. Yes. Right. But but yeah. our plan is for progress. Yes. Obviously. Yes. Actually, that's, that's what we've been saying all along. That this is uh, this, two people calling for a second time, right? No. This no, is Zaris is the first time. Right. Abigail. Zaris. This is actually uh, a bunch of Jared. Uh, even that plumbing board lane in uh, Aberdeen. Um, I just want to start off by saying I, I really hope that the goal of the bill is five days, but uh, I'm a little confused that we're only in phase one uh, of this whole entire process in that uh, my daughter stopped going to school full time March 13, 2001, almost one full year ago, and you're telling me we're just in phase one to bring her back to five-day instruction. Um, I think that's a little bit unacceptable. I think any parent in the district would think that's unacceptable, that we're still in phase one. I hope by now that we, we'd be a little more, more forward. Uh, some of my questions are, uh, why, did it, why did we wait so long to send out a survey? A survey? Um, why, why did it just get sent out now? Um, especially if the numbers are down 70% since December. Um, I feel like we're a, a little, uh, you know, we're behind where we should be. And then uh, why are we looking at, uh, like, the transportation aspect and the class aspect uh, now? Why, why haven't we been looking at that over the last year? Why is it just now that we're looking at that? And why don't we have a contingency plan in place just in case there are too many? Say, you know, you get these surveys back and 95% of the district wants to come back to the school. I don't want another case where it was in September of 2020 where my second grader didn't start school in September. It's not fair to her. She's in second grade, and I'll tell you this, she's on the computer all the time. My wife and uh, myself, we've seen it. Her writing is suffering. She, she just isn't writing the way that a normal second grader should be. On top of that, she's typing all the time. She's never been trained to type. She's not typing properly, and this is causing her to get anxiety. She's seeing, uh, she, she's almost in tears sometimes looking at me because she's rushing to get an assignment done so she's not falling behind during the Google Classroom. Her teacher's great. Listen, he's very patient and whatnot, but she puts a lot of pressure on herself because she wants to succeed. Um, especially kids in second grade, first grade, kindergarten, you know, until, until you're a little older, you know, they're not used to computer. They're not used to properly typing. Their hands aren't built for it. Their attention spans aren't built for it. And they need to learn the fundamentals of writing. They're just not getting it, not being in school. My daughter, since you know, March 2020, we've been in school 140 hours. She's supposed to be scheduled for 1,260 for a whole entire school year. OK, let's, let's back up a bit and let's answer the actual questions that you were asking earlier. So we, we have been planning and talking about transportation and things like that all of the time. However, now that we are moving towards the next step in March, we have to send a survey out again to see 
how many people are interested so then we can go and look at what our classrooms will look like and what those buses would look like. Um, yeah. And we, we only have X amount and number of buses and X amount and number of drivers. So um, well, throughout the state, in, during the course of the past year, there has been a tremendous shortage of bus drivers, um, as well as those services that would provide third party alternatives. So, so really my question would be, is there a threshold where the schools aren't going to open? Non-COVID related. You know what I mean? The numbers are trending down. They're even more, they're even further down than 70%. We're down to 80%, 90% lower than December. Is there a scenario that you're telling me that we're still, even though that the COVID transmission is way down, my child is still not going to be able to go to school? Five days a week, half days. Like, like we said in, in the letter, the numbers are trending down. If they continue to trend down that way, this is what we're looking to do in March. Well, so, well, again, you know, like, I just want to know what, so say 95% of we kids want to go back to school. What is your contingency plan? Are you just going to tell me that certain grades aren't going to go back in, like my daughter at the beginning of the year? Like, I, I just, I feel like you guys aren't being transparent with your contingency plans and letting it out on the line in the public. Well, if this happens, it's like a good cause and effect. Let's be a little proactive and let's be a little transparent and tell every member of the community if we have 95% of the kids say they want to go back to school, well, if this grade's not going to go in, this grade's not going to go in, and that grade's going to go in. Well, if 70% of the kids say they want to go back to school, this is our plan. If 30% say they want to go back in, this is the plan. I don't understand why we are, why it's all smoking mirrors, but we're not getting the full I, I, All right, sir, we have to move on, but I'll answer very quickly, going by the statistics that you're, that you're uh, stating, is that once we get the data back, then we can tell you what the plan is. And even within the plan, there will be still some kids, some uh, parents that want to go full remote. We might have to go cohorts in one school and more five days in another school, and that's all going to depend on the data that comes back to us. So we will have plans developed, multiple plans, but phase one would be to bring back as many kids as we can, five days to half days, and move on, and move on from there, and then build on that plan. I still don't understand why we need the numbers to give out the plan. We should have the plan before we have the numbers. Uh, okay, we need to move on. Thank you. So, Abby? Abby? Hi, my name is Abby Berg, um, Lisa Sutton Drive in Maryland. Um, I keep wondering where I talk about like, the plan and the transportation and the classrooms. And have you, um, I guess my question is, have you like consulted with any other industries that have close contact and how they work it, like the airlines? Because I just came back on a plane yesterday and every single seat was filled. Um, literally, every single seat was filled. And so my question is, how is it that that's possible, but we can't get our kids on buses? Because what it sounds like to me, and I've been trying to be super calm in my house, and I've talked to Ms. Perez, and I've talked to everyone trying to figure certain things out, not only for my child, but for other children. But what I'm hearing tonight is that you guys want to make your plan contingent on how many people want to come back. And that is problematic for me, personally, and I'm sure for other people, because if you want to keep your kid at home, awesome. Homeschool them. Do whatever you need to do. But why should my child and my children be affected? Because that's not possible. You know, it's, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair to the the town, it's not fair to the people, it's not fair to the kids. And at the end of the day, if the airline industry can figure out how to get 250 people on a plane at once, I can't imagine why we can't figure out, like do they have different CDC rules than we do? Are there different things that they're looking at that we're not looking at? Is there a way we can figure out how they're allowed to fill a complete plane? Like not even seats between people, literally, completely full. How they can do that, but we can't get kids into school and kids on the buses. So okay. that's my question. Okay, so the CDC guidelines for other industries is not applicable to education, to school industry. So when you're going back and, and saying to you that 
you know, we still have to follow those guidelines as it's been laid out multiple times. Um, and that's the big difference. So that would be different from the fact that you can put 250 people on a plane, but if you get to, I don't know, I'm going to put a number out there, if you get to 20 students, 23 students in a classroom, you know, you're not abiding by the CDC guidelines. It's, it's, not, even, it's, not, even, it's not even, it's not even, it's not even apples and oranges. Well, is it guidelines or is it laws? Is it like, we think you should do this because it would be safer, or you are in trouble if you don't do it that way? You can end up being in trouble if you basically violate because the DOH can come in and look at you. The DOH can turn around and say, you're not abiding by the CDC guidelines. And if anyone gets ill, and that includes staff, then you're, yes, you're going to be liable. You're going to be held liable for things of that nature. Okay, my other question is this. And I don't know if maybe you guys are not understanding. I feel like it's been asked a lot. But why is it not, why is the plan not, we have 2,000 kids in district, 200 of them need, require busing. Let's make sure that we figure that out. Because if you have everything set up for everything, right, we have 100% back in school if we do that. If you have to take things away, then yes, it makes it easier. I just think that the answers and the way you guys are answering, I don't know if it's purposeful, and I'm hoping it's not, but in the first comment of when we said no comment, someone under the breath said hallelujah, which is pretty rude, um, makes me kind of feel like, you know, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that you guys are just like, yeah, we're going to try to figure it out, but we may not. It depends on y'all, and then you throw it on the parents. Well, we couldn't figure it out because everybody wanted it. This is something that should have been already done, and the fact that you said tentative, that scares me because to me, the way the Board of Ed has been working over this last year, that kind of feels like we're going to give you a little bit of rope to shut y'all up, and then we're going to tell you we can't do it because of A, B, and C technical issues. We want to keep everyone safe. And that's really concerning to me because, again, it feels very like secret society, hush hush. And, you know, I think people would be less upset, kind of, or a little bit more transparent, really transparent. It's uh, not all right. Fun. Thank you. We have to move on. I, I heard you. I heard you. Thank you. Jamie is next. Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Okay, Jamie, we can hear you, or we did hear you, and I think you got cut off. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so um, I'm a little concerned that when um, you were speaking to the last person, you had mentioned uh, maybe one school would be five days, um, but one school might be in a cohort still. That's not sending the kids to school five days a week. Um, that's just one thing. That's still just like the person before just said, that's giving us a little to take it away. The next thing is like, I have one child in school right now that's five days for special needs. My daughter is not in school right now because I had to pay for her to go to school because I work, so it's my husband's central job as I told you guys the last time I spoke to you. So my thing is now, you open up the school five days that day. I work, who's picking up my kid from school? Or well, they're going to the Y Center? Why is it okay for her to go to the Y Center after to finish her school day and not just stay in school for five days? Also, why is this not being planned as if everyone's coming back to school, period? Everybody's going to fill out that, that uh, survey. Everyone's coming back to school. Why don't we just have a plan for everybody? Numbers shouldn't matter, just like the person said before. If we have too much per parent, great. We can always take away. But let's be prepared for 100% of people to come back. I, I really, at this point, it's like I'm banging my head against the wall because I hear everything you guys say, and I and I talk to, to a lot of people, and it's just the answer is to appease people. There's there's nothing else going on. So I'm asking you, why are we not prepared to go um, with 100% of the students going back to school, whether for now it's the quote unquote half day or versus the full day? And what's the difference if my kids in school for half a day at Strathmore? and then going to an after school center to finish the day. That's just mixing her up with more different, with other kids and everything else. Instead of her being in one place, one spot, with one group of kids, five weeks. I okay. just don't get it. Okay, I can answer your question very simply, is that I don't need to plan for 100% for, for of the children to return. All I have to do is get into a time capsule and go back to previous March 2020 because that's what yeah. all the kids were in. But that's, exactly. not, that's not the circumstances right now, 
Okay, so I'm not going to turn around and say, snap my fingers, everybody's coming. What do we do? We, we don't have to work for everybody's coming, but the fact of the matter is, we have to go through phases. Not everyone is going to show up. And we also have to look, even just transportation, we have bus drivers that are out because they're being quarantined. And you can't get bus drivers. Okay, so we have to answer those questions. I think in Dr. Viker's letter, Recently, it said that we might have to depend on parents to basically help us to get the kids back in because we might not be able to safely transport them. I mean, you know, so I can answer your questions. It's a matter of whether you want to accept the answer or not. I mean, I'm accepting what you're saying on the transportation act. I can get that. But the point of the matter is, what, what it sounds like you're saying is that if let's just say 95% of the population of the children that go to school in the district say they're coming back, you just basically told me that then they're not going to go back five days, even right now. Never mind the full deal. That's what you just said. I will answer your question at the next meeting when we get the data that comes back in and so that we can develop a plan that is actually doable. Well, I would suggest that you guys start thinking about a higher number than you think about because I, I've talked to a lot of people in, in, in the area and a lot of people want to come back. I think right. it would be really disappointing if you're going to come back and say, too many people wanted to come back, so now you're not. And All that's right. exactly what it just sounds like. But yes, we'll talk next. All right, thank, thank you. Thanks. Yes, um, Mr. K, we're back on the second round. People that are speaking for the second time. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Hey. K. Mr. K? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Okay, so I, I have numerous questions here. Um, I, I kind of laughed because one of you said you were doing your best. Um, my, my main question is, and I guess it starts with a comment that some of the, the kind of minds, um, some of the comments that were made, um, but this is public school, and, and I think the lady just now said it, um, that you have the option, you know, generally speaking, to homeschool, true homeschool, you have the option to hire parochial school, etc. This is public school. Your job is to provide, in fact, constitutionally, it's in the New Jersey Constitution, to provide public school. So you're not doing that job. You're a board that's supposed to run that system, and then teachers who are public employees paid by taxpayers are supposed to be at work. And they have paid time off to take otherwise, All right, not so, be at work. Do, do you have a question? My, yes, my question is, can I get you guys to put the children first and right now have this board resign so that other people can take these positions? No, that's, that's my not, question. That's, Will you resign right now? No, that's not going to happen. And we don't all, we don't well, that was my always question. have to put the children first, but we also have to think about the staff. The adults. No, you should not. You should put the children really? first. That is their job. And right. their job might be a little more dangerous, but they are, if you're putting the children first, then you go to work. You're a public employee. Quit or go to work. All right, thank you. Next. Ms. Jimenez? Ms. Jimenez? Ms. Jimenez? Hi, good evening again. It's Tina Jimenez from uh, 43 Lakeside Drive again. Um, I have a kind of whole, totally different question in regards to obviously the plexiglass and some of these things that we're doing into the school system and to the schools is costly. What? And, and, and you may have talked about this at the board event, and I may have missed it. What is the board doing in regards to applying for grants from the federal government? For instance, I heard today on Fox Business, they their first stimulus package, there was billions of dollars allocated to public school systems to get kids back to school. This second stimulus package they are pushing through is also billions of dollars. However, public school systems across the country, not just our state, have not been utilizing these grants to ensure that these kids have a safe environment, the teachers feel safe, the kids feel safe, everybody feels safe to get these kids back to school. So there's all of this money floating out there, and I want to know what grants are we using in our district and applying for it in our district to go after this money to ensure that in September of 2021, these kids are going back to school full time. Because at the end of the day, this is all that matters. These kids need to go back to school. We all know, we talked it about it endlessly at these board of ed meetings. And there's a ton of money out there that will allow us to be 
to utilize instead of putting the burden on the taxpayers, which my taxes went up eight hundred dollars this year, which is utterly ridiculous considering the federal government is giving money away hand over fist. All right, Mr. Zivinas, I'm going to let Dr. Micro answer your question. So we we have spent over two hundred and fifty thousand of our original pairs grant. Um, the stimulus that was passed in December. Those numbers were just released last week and will not be made available until um, sometime later in March, which we will be using, um, as we spoke about, for our robust summer programs, tutoring programs, um, all of those, all of those academic measures that we will need um, to get us back moving um, and continue to move forward. So that those monies. Um, have not yet been dispersed to the districts, and we have applied for any and all other grants that have been out there for um, anything from SEL to to any kind of academic program. So the answer to that is yes. Perfect. I guess, and just a follow-up question in regards to that: it, it, Did the plexiglass money come from um, this grant? Is that where that money came from? It came from your original CARES funding that was given to us, yes. Okay. And then I guess a follow-up question. It might not be something that the Board of Ed can even address. And I'm starting to see it across other states in the, in the country, is that school choice is now becoming an option. Meaning, because these private school systems have been able to figure it out, the Catholic school systems have been able to figure out how to get the kids back to school full time, a lot of states are now starting to think about and opt in for school choice for children. Meaning, we don't have to go to the public school system. We don't have to be beholden to the public school system, nor the teachers union. We can have a choice on whether we want to take our tax dollars. So if I pay $15,000 in taxes, I can take that tax dollars and allocate it to uh, a school of my choice. If it doesn't cover all the costs, that's my problem. But it's, a, it's school choice. And again, I don't know if the board of that question, but it's something to really start considering as parents. Because at the end of the day, we shouldn't be beholden to uh, public school systems and dic being dictated to as parents, as taxpayers. Okay, there's, there's two things I'll just clarify before we move on. One is you're, you're somewhat talking about voucher systems, which don't exist in the state of New Jersey. And the state of New Jersey does have what's called school choice. But you have to basically look at what schools are willing to take kids from another district, and then that money would follow the child. Next. Stephanie B. Stephanie B. <coughs> Hello, Stephanie Bonner, 23, and you go lean again. Um, I just have a quick question. So based on all the people responding, it sounds like the biggest issue that would come out of this if 100% of the population comes back is transportation. Can you confirm that seems to be the biggest pain point on figuring out a plan or phases? That's, that's one major problem. That's one major issue, yes. Okay. And second, I'll go back to the original. And second, it does the CDC require a certain amount of students per classroom? They talk about space. In other words, every classroom has square footage. Every child right. is supposed to have like 20 to 21 square feet around them. So depending on the size of the class, it depend on your social distancing and whether and, and the number in terms of like, if you had a very big room, you probably could fit that many more kids in there, but and have them socially distanced appropriately. If you have a smaller room, it's, it's not going to happen. So you might have had a class at the beginning of the year that had 23 kids in it, but social distancing is going to limit that at that particular time to maybe 14. Okay. I thought the plexiglass was fixing that situation. That's I one thought the thing. plexiglass... Yeah, that, that's one thing, especially in elementary schools. You're looking at masks, you're looking at, uh, you know, washing your hands frequently, you're looking at plexiglass, but you're still looking at social distancing and, and the arrangement of the classroom in terms of, it's, it's all outlined in the uh, plan to go back, the restart plan. Okay, and the Department of Health and Department of Education go by the CDC guidelines. But the CDC guidelines are just suggestions. And as you mentioned earlier, basically someone's saying that if someone just gets sick, you could be held liable if you don't follow that. But I don't understand since they're just suggestions. 
So far, I'm kind of confused. The, the, department, you clarify. the Department of Health will offer you suggestions. However, you still need to follow the CDC guidelines. Now, when you turn around and talk about <clears throat> anything, the masks have to be there. The hand washing should happen. The plexiglass is great. If you turn around and say, I can't get the six feet, but practicable, I can get five and a half feet, that's when they would turn around and say, okay, with everything else in place, we're good with that. But outside of that, you turn around and say, you really are putting yourself into a very dangerous situation if you pick and choose what you decide to do based on the fact that you're going to turn around and say, well, the CDC is recommending or they're suggesting, I'll tell you, the DOH suggests the CDC is telling you this is the recommendation. Right. So, so in other words, they, they technically, you are not, you have the choice to say, okay, well, we're still going to move forward or not, correct? Is that what I'm understanding? We, it's as, not long, as, as, as long as we're, down. yes, as long as we're, as, as, the, as the percentage of, uh, comes down in terms of the infectious percentage comes down and then we're looking at, you know, bringing more and more kids back in. But as you started out, you got to think about the transportation issues. You got to think about the staffing issues. You have to think about a lot of one building could be far greater inhabited than another building. So you might, in order to get more kids back in, take them from one building and move them to another. There's a lot that needs to be looked at. Okay, so as far as, back to my original question, the transportation, those guidelines are still from the Department of Health and recommendations or suggestions from the Department of Health, Department of Education, and they're doing it based off CDC guidelines? Yes. Okay. Is and, like, and, and, uh, you can't, and you cannot put plexiglass up in, inside buses. Totally understand. Um, you as the Board of Education and the union, what are you guys doing to push back? Because like Abby mentioned, um, I just flew two and my plane was completely full. And I know, obviously, they go by different industry standards, et cetera, et cetera. But what are you doing at the Board of Health to push back and say, guys, this isn't practical. Practical. The infection rate is, you know, 0.00 percent for children. And those are the only people that are on the bus besides the driver, which you can in fact put. Okay. Buses. All right. All right. So I what have, are you guys doing? I have to move on. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Please let me. My question. My I, I heard your question. Your original question was, what are we doing? And we're basically, yes, we are meeting with the heads of the unions who basically, they, they are very much wanting to bring the kids back, but at the same time, you know, we're not going to rush through that. We're not going to turn around and say to somebody, you've got to bring back, it's going to be 100%. I mean, you do have people uh, that teach here that are in other areas in, in terms of staffing. Uh, some of them have had COVID. Some of them have had family members that have gotten sick. Some have had family members that have passed away. So you turn around and you say, everybody's saying, the children, the children. I agree with you, the children are a primary concern, but you can't turn around and bring back 25 kids in a class and then turn around and say, I don't know if I'm gonna have a teacher to go into that class because I needed those staff on the other side in another building, all right? That's part of the data that we're gathering. Once we gather- That wasn't my question. That wasn't my question. My question was specifically to transportation. Transportation, only children are on the bus besides the driver. If the driver can have plexiglass, the children are on the bus. It doesn't matter if they're all going into the same, if, or they're going into a classroom. It seems like our big pain point would be transportation. And from, I'm trying to understand from a pain point, what are you guys doing to push back and go, hey, listen, we're going to do what we need to do to get our kids on the buses and get them to school? I, I, all right, again. Uh, we only we have our own buses. We we only have so many buses, and we only have so many drivers, and we have a number of them out right now. And in terms of on a, a regular size bus, maybe maybe if you go by the CDC guidelines, you're looking at anywhere from 11 to maybe 14, maybe 15 you can get away with. But at the same time, you know that's a major concern. That's a major concern. So you know we're what looking. What's the major we're, concern? We're looking at all this. I know, but what is the major concern that COVID CDC right on guidelines, the bus? CDC guidelines on a bus. That has been the major concern from every school district in this state and other states. 
Okay, but based on the science and the data, it shows the infection rate for children is uh, all right. zero I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm so not, I'm I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into that where you start quoting all of these different statistics and think that I can make decisions on that and not care about my staff, not care about some kids, not care about families, because there's a group of parents that say, I want what I want now. Uh, that's not going to happen, okay? So we can continue to talk about this, but right now, do we have somebody else on? We have, two, we have yes, Mr. K for the third time. No, uh, only twice. Okay, then we are, that's done. We're done? We have no more. Right. Um, here's one. Oh, okay. So I, I wrote down what? Is somebody else on that hasn't talked yet? Yes. All right. Go ahead. Call them on. Mr. Marchada? Mr. Marchada. Hello? Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Hi, how are you? My name is Leonardo Marchada. And uh, I basically just wanted to say that uh, you guys are sort of giving these people a runaround as far as not putting the kids in school. It's not a group of parents that want what they want. It's a group of parents that want what's best for their children. What's best for their children is to have a choice. That's what this country was founded on. Now, by you guys spitting out the numbers that you constantly regurgitate, just like the old British Do you have a question, sir? Sir, do you have a question? No, 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 I have a statement. All right, well. I'm, I'm allowed to a statement, sir. I'm allowed to make a statement. I'm allowed by law to say whatever I want. For three minutes, I have the time. I'm pulled in, and I have a right to speak. So you have, you, did, you, did you give us your address? My address is not, I don't have to give that to you. All right, so we're, 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 yeah. sir, we're finished at this point. are a very terrible excuse for a board. Cut. You should all be embarrassed. Cut. Have a yes. Cut. That's it. No more. All right. Mr. Marchada, you have a motion to adjourn. Second with second. No motion. All second. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Good night, everybody.